And for those of you that are new or visiting, we started um, well over a year ago, almost a year and a half ago, a series on Wednesday night going through the books of the kings. We understand that originally these books were one book divided into two. We entitled our series, um, Le uh, The Fall of a Kingdom, Lessons for the Church. And for many of our folks, it was the first time that they've ever done a verse-by-verse -verse study of these two books. They are finding that the Old Testament is rich in, in its application, rich in its instruction, rich in its blessing. By the way, the Old Testament is just as much the Word of God as the New Testament is. All of it is inspired by God. Uh, God breathed. It is the Word of God. And so there is tremendous enjoyment and pleasure in that. And we have been looking through at the nation of Israel. In 1 Kings, it opens up with the nation united. We understand that it's not long that David dies. There's a transition to his son Solomon. Solomon was the wisest man to ever live, but he was foolish in his behavior, and uh, his sin caused the division of that kingdom. did not happen in his life. It happened in his son's life, Rehoboam. We know the young man Jeroboam took the um, northern ten tribes. Rehoboam took the two southern tribes. And from that moment on, really and truthfully, there's been only moments of light, only moments of truth and blessing. Most of the time we read about Israel going in a direction against the Lord and against His Word, against the covenant and against those promises. Therefore, they find themselves um, under the chastening hand of God. The Bible said, whom the Lord loveth, He chasteneth. Uh, one of the ways you know that you are saved is if you sin and you do not repent at the conviction of the Spirit of God upon that, then God will, the Lord Jesus will, will discipline you. How many have ever been spanked by the Lord and you know it? Amen. My senior year, buddy, he spanked me something fierce. I'll never forget that. And, uh, but that's evidence that he loves me. A guy that, or a woman that says that they're a Christian and they can live in sin and there's never any exposure to that sin. There's never any conviction of that. There's never any chastening of that. And we know that the Bible calls them a bastard, which would be an illegitimate when it comes to being a child of God. And so we thank God for that. The nation of Israel is finding itself being chastened by the Lord because he loves them, because he's drawing them back to himself. Um, when we come to the end of First Kings, the, the kingdom is divided. You come into the beginning of Second Kings, and we've been looking at this divided kingdom. When we get to the end of Second Kingdom, or Second Kings, really and truthfully, the kingdom doesn't exist. Both uh, the northern and the southern kingdom are in captivity and things are really bleak for the nation. In the midst of all of that, we have been able to take passages and uh, expo expositorily go through them and draw from them lessons that the church can use today. And so I trust that it has been a blessing to you. I've enjoyed it in my own life. Uh, we come today to 2 Kings chapter 8. Verse number 1 will give us a little bit of the uh, context of where we are. The Bible says, Then spake Elisha, we know Elisha to be the prophet of God that followed Elijah. First and Second Kings um, have really and truthfully, most of the activity there is surrounded around Elijah and Elisha. We know that Elisha uh, has dominated Second Kings. He's dominated with God's power. God's miraculous power, God's wisdom, God's vision. He has been shown himself faithful through the prophecy of Elisha. Verse 8 says, Then spake Elisha unto the woman, and then she is identified here, whose son he had restored to life. Once again, we find ourselves in chapter 8, that we find the Word of God taking us back to the Shunammite woman, to this woman who we first were introduced in 2 Kings chapter 4. And I want you to turn back to chapter 4 just for a moment, um, and you will find... 
that in verse number 8 of chapter 4, you might remember the message I preached uh, regarding verses 8, 11, and 18, where it said, and it fell on a day, and it fell on a day, and it fell on a day. We looked at the life of this Shunammite woman in the three days of her life when she was serving the Lord, when she was uh, recognized by the Lord, by, by God, and rewarded with a child and provided for. And then we found in 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 18, that there was a sad day when that child died. But we do understand at the end of that chapter that we find that God raised her child back from the dead and restored life unto him. A lot has gone on in chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7. But we find ourselves once again God remembering this woman. Once again... Uh, God, God goes back to this woman, to, uh, to her life, to teach us truth and to illustrate his greatness and his faithfulness. I, I think that is outstanding that God could, can continue to use the life of one person to teach how great he is. I, I really want God to use my life to teach and illustrate his goodness. If you want him to use your life, say amen. And the fact that he will, and the fact that he keeps going back to this woman um, is a testimony to her. It's a testimony to her faithfulness. It's a testimony to her heart for him. Um, I'll tell you, there is nothing greater in life than being used of God and, and being used of God in a way to, to bring him glory. So we find ourselves in these six verses, uh, the first six verses of chapter 8. It's like a little parenthesis here. When we get into chapter, or verse number 7, to the rest of the chapter, and into chapter number 9, it gets evil again, it gets gory again, it gets bloody again. There's murder in the end of this chapter. Things will begin to happen in the nation of Israel that they never dreamed would happen. But they're going to. But here in our chapter tonight, I want to preach you a message. I, want to, I entitled the message, God is in control so I can be content. God is in control so I can be content. The Apostle Paul said in the book of Philippians that he had learned in whatsoever state he was in to be content. And, and contentment is something that is really lacking today amongst God's people. When you see it, it is rare. It's also beautiful. It's wonderful. It's something that is, is almost godly envied when you see contentment in the life of a person. We kind of live in a day where we think that contentment is no longer possible. But I promise you it is possible. There is no reason for a Christian to live a life of discontent. No reason. A lot of people do. But that's not what God saved us for. And that's not who Christ is. And so he said he had learned to be content. I find in these six verses some things that we could learn tonight to help us to be content. And we're going to look again at the life of the Shunammite woman here. And so I want to give you three things that show God's control and the things that he's in control of. And hopefully it will bring rest to your heart and to your mind in whatever situation you find yourself tonight. Pick up, if you would, at verse number one. Then spake Elisha unto the woman whose son he had restored to life, saying, Arise, and go thou and thine household, and sojourn wheresoever thou canst sojourn. For the Lord hath called for a, say it class, a famine. And it shall also come upon the land seven years. And the woman arose and did after the saying of the man of God. And she went with her household and sojourned in the land of the Philistines seven years. We found from earlier messages and from places like Deuteronomy that God would use famine. God would use uh, this specific 
act and this specific dryness and this, this specific type of, uh, uh, of incident for really and truthfully as a punishment or a chastisement to the nation of Israel. God said, if you will obey me, there will always be plenty. There will always be freshness. There will always be rain. There will always be crops. But if you disobey me, famine is going to come into the land. And so we have seen the disobedience of the nation of Israel. But no matter how how disobedient we are, God still remains faithful. And God's word is faithful. And so, it, because of their behavior, God calls, I like that in verse number uh, uh, one, the Lord called for a famine. Um, it's, it's interesting because our world doesn't believe this today. But in the beginning, God did create the heaven and the earth. He is the great creator. Um, there does not exist anything that God did not create physically. Um, our world is so up in arms over something called global warming. I do promise you that one day the earth is going to get real warm. Um, you read Peter. I mean, I have been reading the books of First and Second Peter, and God will not let me get out of those books. I, I, I know he's got one message in there for me that I'm going to preach you pretty soon, but he won't let me loose. I tried to get loose yesterday, and he said, get back in First Peter. So I got back in there. But Peter talks about there will be a time when this earth will be renovated with fire. I hope you don't picture this earth blowing up and a new earth being formed. That's not what the Bible's talking about. God's going to renovate this earth with fire fire and it will bring about a holiness to it. Um, the issue of global warming to a believer needs to be put in the perspective of the Word of God. I hope you're not nervous about global warming. I, you can respect and you can honor the environment. You can be green. You can recycle. I'm learning to recycle. But let's be real clear about something. There is no such thing as Mother Nature. No Christian ought to ever use the words Mother Nature. If you ever use the word Mother Nature, then you deny God the Father. Be careful about that. So... Well, Pastor, I'm, 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 I'm for a certain whatever because, you know, I'm with this global warming thing. No, you put that in perspective of the Word of God, you will find that God created nature. God created nature with enough... And God didn't create nature and just spin it and let it spin for itself. God cares for nature every moment of its existence. I'm going to show you a couple of fascinating things here in a moment. You know, I have found that nature has power. You ever been in a hurricane, you will know nature has power. You ever been in a flood, you will understand the power of water. Nature has power. But nature, as powerful as it is, is still controlled by God. God is in control of nature. He's all powerful there. And so God has the ability to use nature. So here's the nation of Israel. And they're, they're sinning against God. And so God uses nature to, to chastise them. And God does reveal I, I do believe even today God, God can reveal his pleasure or displeasure by nature. Listen, don't just think that famine and dryness is just something that's cyclical. Famine and dryness is something God calls for. Pastor, California's on fire. Amen. Our world is on fire. Our world is dry and famine and barren. Yeah, because our world refuses to repent and honor God. I'm all for sending money to help the African children or the Haitian children or the whatever. 
we see the deplorable things that they live in, but I want you to know something. They don't, they don't need our, our money or our ingenuity more than they need our Jesus. Amen. That's what the world needs. It needs Jesus Christ. It amazes me, the same people that put out these things showing the environment and the famine and these people and they want our money, these are the same people that are murdering the babies in the womb. Somewhere we got off balance as a world. We get off balance when we get apart from the Word of God. Amen? And so we have God calling the famine. He's calling nature. He's using nature. He's in control of that. Um, would you hold your hand here? Go to Psalm 148. Let's hold, put something in 2 Kings. God, God's in control of nature. Here, in, in, in really and truthfully, Psalm 148 is fascinating to show what God, how God still uses that today. How God is still in control of, of the storms. How God's still in control of physical nature, but yes, He's also in control of spiritual storms. Um, pick up, if you would, in verse number 1 of Psalm 148. Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights. Praise ye Him, all His angels. Praise ye Him, all His hosts. Praise ye Him, sun and moon. We live in a South Florida. We have the cultures of the world that are at our doorstep. I used to live by a neighbor who they worshiped the sun. They believed the sun was God. They believed the sun was worthy of being worshiped. But the Bible says that the sun should praise the creator. It's interesting. You know, I have found that the Bible does go against most of the religious philosophies of today. Ver look at verse 3. Praise ye him, sun and moon. Praise ye him, all ye stars of light. Praise, ye, praise him, ye heavens of heavens, ye waters that be above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded, and they were, say it class, created. He hath also established them forever and ever. But I thought they were going to burn up. I thought we're losing the ice. I thought the polarization is going to switch. No, he's established them. He hath made a decree which shall not pass. Praise the Lord from the earth, ye dragons and all the deeps. Talking about those sea creatures. Verse number 8 is fascinating. Fire, hail, snow, vapors, stormy wind, fulfilling, say those two words. His word. His word. Who's in control of the storm? God is. Who's in control of the fire? God is. Who's in control of the hail? God is. Mountains and all hills, fruitful trees and all cedars, beasts and all cattle, creeping things and flying fowl, kings of the earth, all people, princes and all judges of the earth, young men and maidens, old men and children, let them praise the name of the Lord for his name alone is excellent. His glory is above the earth and heaven. He also exalteth the horn or the power of his people. The praise of all his saints, even of the children of Israel, a people near unto him, praise ye the Lord. I got news for you. Our God is all powerful. He controls nature. He controls the storms. Now listen to pastor. He controls the physical storm, but he also controls the spiritual storm. I need you to go, if you would, please, to 1 Peter chapter 4. I told you I've been living in this, past, this book a while. 1 Peter chapter 4. Verse number 12. What's the first word of that verse? When the Bible uses the word beloved, who is the Bible talking about? Us or the saints or the church? So whenever you read the word beloved in the New Testament, he's talking about the church. So he's talking about you and I. Church, 
Think it not, what? Strange. Concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. He's saying, don't think it strange when storms come your way. Don't think it strange when you lose your job. Don't think it strange when you're sick. Don't think it's strange when some fiery thing happens to you. Rejoice. Verse 14, if ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. Let none of you suffer as a murderer, as a thief, or as the evildoer, as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet, if any man suffer as a, say that name please, Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. If it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? If the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Now look at verse 19. Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the, what are those three words? Pastor? Can it ever be the will of God that I suffer? Absolutely. Is all of my suffering the will of God? No. The Bible said, no, no, don't let any Christian suffer for certain things. But there will be times in your life that God controlling the storm... He's going to bring that into your life and try you in that fiery trial. And God said, it's going to be according to my will. Don't think it strange. Watch what he tells you to do in verse 19. Let them that suffer according to the will of God commit. It doesn't say freak out. <laughs> It doesn't say grumble or complain. It doesn't say murmur. It doesn't say quit. It says commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a, say it class, faithful creator. So when you come back to 2 Kings chapter 8 and you look at verses 1 and 2, God is getting ready to inflict suffering. God is getting ready to use nature. He's in control of it, but he's getting ready to use it for a purpose. Now, in his graciousness, he comes to this woman and he warns her and he protects her and he sends her to a safe spot. Let me tell you something. I do think a lot of times before God sends us into a fiery trial, he does, he does warn us. But I'm not sure that we're taking the time to walk with him. Let me tell you something. You and I need Jesus Christ every moment of our life. There is no way you can run your guts out. There is no way you can get up in the morning and go about your day week after week after week and never stop and sit and listen to God and, and not be surprised or insecure when these things happen. The, pro the problem is, we don't spend enough time with him to hear his still, small voice in the quietly, quietness and directed of this. And a lot of times, listen, I don't know any shepherd that doesn't see the storm before the sheep see the storm. And if a shepherd sees the storm, he prepares the sheep. And sometimes God's getting ready to send a storm into your life, one he is in control of. One that he is going to use. And I do think he comes and prepares us for that. But we don't, we don't ever sit down to listen. I am afraid to go very long without checking in with the Lord. God is in control of this. Verse number three. It came to pass... 
at the seven years end that the woman returned out of the land of the Philistines she went forth to cry unto the king for her house and for her land and the king talked with Gehazi now you might remember this he was the servant of Elisha the servant of the man of God saying tell me I pray thee all the great things that Elisha hath done so the king is interested in what Elisha has done and him somehow uh, him and Gehazi are having a conversation in this moment. Verse number 5. And it came to pass as he was telling the king how he had restored a dead body to what? Life. Life. Now listen. You're never going to know contentment until number one you know that, that God is in control of the storms. He's in control of nature. He's in control of it physically and he's in control of it spiritually. Number two, you're not going to know commit contentment until you believe that God is in control of life and death. See, most of us live our lives paralyzed by the thought of life and death. Everything, we even have a phrase in English, it's life or, life or death. And it seems like we use the word crises all the time. I got news for you. God has never run into a crisis. We live our lives from crises to crises. And one of, the, one of the biggest things that scare us into a position of whatever, not walking with the Lord, is the understanding of life and death. And, 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 and the king wants to hear about the great things that Elisha did. And the number one thing that Gehazi says is, listen, he restored a dead body to life. What is he teaching us there? He's teaching us that God is in control of life and death. And when you understand that God is in control of that and you stop trying to control it, you find peace come over you. So many applications here. Life or death when it comes to relationships. Life or death when it comes to job. Life and death when it comes to finance. Life and death when it comes to health. Life and death when it comes to family. Life and death when it comes... It seems like, it seems like that life and death thought and that pressure just consumes and everything is a crisis. And so instead of allowing God who's, who's in control of those things, allow, allowing Him to to lead and guide and direct there, we, we try to manipulate and carry that all we can. You know, one of the greatest verses in the Bible, I preached to you a few weeks ago. I want to read it to you. I want you to go back to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. I don't necessarily know how you get to this place, but I'm going to tell you this is a place you need to get to in your Christian life. Are you there? Verse 21. For to me to live is, say his name, and to die is what? For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul, Paul got to the place in his life where, listen, Everything about my life is, is in Christ's hands. If Christ wants me to be rich, I'll be rich. If He wants me to be poor, I'll be poor. If He wants me to be, have a job, I'll have a job. If He wants me to be married, I'll be married. If He wants me to suffer, I'll suffer. He wants, he wants to break me, He can break me. He wants to mold me, He can mold me. He wants to destroy me, He can destroy me. He wants to exalt me, He can, destroy, he can exalt me. Everything in my life has been submitted to the authority of Jesus Christ. And oh yeah, by the way, if I go down, I go up. You know, ooh, ooh, things, things, we clutch onto things so tight, like, like they are our life breath. And when you got to get to a position where you just say, Lord, I want everything about my life to be about Christ. If you strip it all, 
And if I die, then I'm with you. But whether I make it or we don't make it, I'm with you. There are times in my life, man, I bow my head and I say, now God, I believe this is what you want me to do. I'm going to do it. But if we go down, we're going down together. We're going down together. But I'm going to go up or down, depending upon you. Not down to hell, but up or down. I'm going to either prosper or not, successful or not. I don't care, but I want you to be magnified in my body. And the king said to Gehazi, tell me about Elisha. What's he doing? And he said, I'll tell you what he's doing. He's got, he's, he's got power over death and life. And what's God trying to tell you? I'm in control of death and life, and you can trust me. You're not in control. I'll read you some verses you need to hear them. I won't even tell you where they are, other than they're in the Bible. The oldest man we think we, we have, one of the early patriarchs, is Job. Listen to what he said. He said, in whose hand is the soul of every living thing, in God's hand is the soul of every living thing, and the breath of all mankind. He's in complete control. Listen to what Solomon said in the book of Ecclesiastes, if I could find it here. It's a powerful verse, Ecclesiastes chapter 8. He says it like this, There is no man that hath power over the spirit to retain the spirit. Neither hath he power in the day of death. There is no discharge in the war, neither shall wickedness deliver those that are given to it. Listen, nobody in this room keeps their spirit in their body. You might keep your body skinny, you're not doing a very good job of that. <laughs> You might keep your body to function a little bit longer, but your spirit could be taken out of your body just like that. You can't, you can't chain it. You can't bribe it. You can't inflate it. You do not have power over life and death, but praise God, our Savior does. We're so nervous about the little things of life. It gets better. Go, if you would, to verse number 5. Not only is he in control of, the, of nature and the storms of our life physically and spiritually, not is he in, only in control of life and death, but it's a fascinating event what happens here. Don't lose the context. Elisha came to the woman and said, there's a famine coming. Go live somewhere for seven years. She left everything. Remember, remember chapter 4. She's a great woman. She has a house big enough where she built on a room. She's a woman of wealth and means. She leaves all of that under the direction of the man of God. She's gone. And now she comes back and she wants her home back. No problem. In those days, when you had a... a um, a, a, a problem. You didn't stand before the judge. You went and you stood before the king. Don't you remember the two harlots that came in and they, they were before Solomon and the one baby had died and she had stolen the other baby and King Solomon said, bring me a sword. What do you need a sword for? Lay that living child down right there. Take that sword, cut it in half. He got to the truth real quick, didn't he? So she comes before the king. If you look at verse number five, and it came to pass as he, that is Gehazi, was telling the king how he had restored a dead body to life, that, what's that next word? Oh, only about half of you got it. What's the next word? Behold. Verse 5. You got to see this. It's fascinating. And it came to pass as he was telling the king how he had restored a dead body to life, that behold, the woman whose son he had restored to life, cried to the king for her house and for her land. And Gehazi said, what a dink!" <laughs> and Gehazi said, my lord, king, this is the woman I'm telling you about. And this is her son 
whom Elisha restored to life. And when the king asked the woman, she told him. So the king appointed under her a certain officer, saying, Restore all that was hers and all the fruits of the field since the day that she left the land, even until now. Pastor, do I understand that right? Yes. Are you telling me that it's just a normal day and the king wants to hear from Gehazi about, about Elisha? And so Gehazi comes in, sits down the king, and sits down Elisha. And on that same day, at that exact same time, in that same moment, that same woman walks into that same room and, and says, I need my land. And Gehazi says, this is the woman I'm telling you. That happened? Yeah. You see... He's awesome enough to be in control of nature, life, and death, and he's tender enough to be in the control of the moments of our lives. And here is this woman who's coming to the king, and God is orchestrating this meeting. She has no idea. None. Gehazi, no idea. The king, no idea. She's coming in, crying for her land. And, and God's putting A and B and C and moving all these parts. And God's bringing them all together at an appointed and ordained time. Because he is God. Amen. He's in control of the moments of our lives, people. He's in control of the bad and the good. Remember, remember, this is the same woman whose son died in her lap. Never in that moment when that little boy died did this woman know how God would later use that incident for her good. <laughs> Joseph never dreamed. Oh, he had all kinds of dreams. But he never dreamed that being shoved in a pit, pulled up out, sold as a slave, accused of rape, sent into a prison, forgotten by everyone, Slater comes into the house of Pharaoh, never dreamed that that bad day, one day God would use for good. And sometimes in our lives we think that for just a moment God forgot about me. What happened when my kid died? What happened when my wife left? What happened when I lost my job? Where were you? He's in the moments of, those li of your life. And he's orchestrating them. Well, I don't believe in chance. Well, good, because neither do I. I believe in the holy God. And he'll take the moments of our lives. And he's in control of them. Finish this for me. All things work together for good. He's in control of the bad. He's in control of the good. Look, if you would, right there in verse number 5. As he was telling the king, can you imagine? Can you imagine? It reminds me of a verse. I love this verse. I find myself thinking about it often. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him. And he what class? Shall direct thy paths. Pastor, is every moment of my life directed by the providential hand of God? No. 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 The moments of your sin are not directed by God. Some people want to say that God is in control of everything even when we sin. Let me tell you something. God has never caused anyone to sin. God has never directed anyone to sin. God can, God can use your sin later in your life for His good. But only after there has been repentance, only after there has been the cleansing of the, of, of, of the blood of Christ, only after there has been mercy. And by the way, just so you don't think you can go out and sin and think that God's later going to use it for your good, all sin has consequence. David never dreamed that an affair with Bathsheba would cost so much. 
But Solomon was born. See, this woman loved God. She trusted God. She followed after Him. And He directed her paths. And He brought the moments of her life. If you're going to not follow God, then you can't really blame God for all the moments of your life. He may be merciful to you down the road, but you may pay a deep price. Amen. Amen. Would you go to Hebrews chapter 12 real quick? I want you to go to Hebrews 12, then I want you to find 2 Timothy 2 and we'll be done. In Hebrews chapter 12, this I believe was written by the Apostle Paul. I can't prove that. It's just what I believe. He's encouraging these saints who are being persecuted and tremendously needy. In verse number 25, he says, See that ye refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. Speaking of God, of course, Christ. Whose voice then shook the earth. But now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. Boy, there's coming a day, my friend, when the voice of God's going to shake the world. And this word, verse 27, yet once more signifieth the removing of those things that are, what's that word? Shaken. Shaken. As of the things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved... We may serve who, class? God, verse 28. Acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Listen. Our world is shaking today. Our world is unnerved. Our world apart from God doesn't know which way is up, which way is down. There's no truth. There's no honesty. There's no integrity. The kingdoms of the earth are shaking. I want you to go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Look, if you would, at verse number 19. Nevertheless... The foundation of God, what are those two words? Standeth sure. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are His. If you're one of His, say amen. amen. The Lord knows you. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. What can you learn from 2 Kings Chapter number 8 from the Shunammite woman one more time. You can learn. Our God is all powerful. He's, he's in control over the storms. He's in control over nature. The physical storms that you go through and the spiritual storms that you go through. He is in control over life and death. He's in control of the moments of your lives. The whole world can be shaking. But there is no reason for anybody in this room that knows Jesus Christ not to believe that the foundation of God standeth sure. Yes. And He knows me. He knows my name. He knows where I am. He knows my strength. He knows my weakness. He knows my problem. He knows the storm I'm going in. He knows how He's going to keep me. And he is worthy of our trust. Therefore, class, be content. We serve the risen king. Amen? Amen. Shall we pray?